The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson, read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 1. In this episode, Ola and Michael are celebrating the countdown to their wedding, but something is about to happen that will change everything and make them question themselves and the world they live in. One that revolves and thrives on social media. Michael, 27 days to the wedding. They'd been out celebrating the night before it happened, their table littered with emptied champagne flutes. The happy couple unknowingly toasting the beginning of the end. Michael surveyed the scene as he sat in the corner of an oxblood-coloured booth, his wife-to-be's long legs stretched out across his lap. But I cannot believe you, Ola said. You really can't say it. Michael reached over her lap for another glass. How am I supposed to know the answer, bruv? He said. You not answering is an answer, to be honest. Ola untangled her legs from his. Michael feigned a pensive sigh. Aye, give me a minute to think. An entire 60 seconds to decide whether the 8th of June will be the happiest day of your life. What's currently ranking higher? Enlighten me. Michael stroked his beard. Do not say the first time I let you smash, Michael, she said, punching his arm. He shot her a falsely incredulous look. Because I'm about to go full Real Housewives of Streatham. Laughing, Michael pulled her face towards him and kissed her forehead. Ola wriggled, giggling hysterically. Move, man. You're trying to distract me and it won't work. I want answers, Michael. He couldn't remember a time they'd been happier. If he'd known what the next day held, he wouldn't have dared to risk joking about their future together. He would have told her that he struggled to pinpoint the happiest day of his life because he couldn't decide between the day she agreed to marry him or the day she told him she loved him too. Ola, 26 days to the wedding. Ola awoke at half past eight to the sound of the pinging of WhatsApp messages. Languidly, she slid her finger across the iPhone screen to silence it. 139 flipping messages. Ola could guess who from. The latest episode of Game of Thrones had aired the night before, and she could already picture the group chat's commentary. And a couple of dozen messages would no doubt be from the florist. She winced as her phone buzzed twice more. It slowly occurred to her the likely source of most of the messages was from her boss, Frankie. Ola had promised to file the copy for a sponsored post by 7.30am. She had less than 20 minutes to get ready. Bleary-eyed, she tried to access her phone. It shook in response. You are hashtag blocked. Hashtag blocked was the weapons-grade phone restriction app she'd installed to keep her off apps in the morning. A pop-up window obscured her phone screen until 9.30. Ola sat up properly now. She drew back the curtains, bright orange against the dismal South London sky. Last night's clothes were flung at the end of her bed, she smiled, remembering the night before. The poor boy got the Uber back with her to put her to bed, bless him. She could still smell Michael's Tom Ford aftershave in the room and could vaguely make out him removing her heels and bundling her under her duvet. Ola felt a pang of guilt. He'd had an early start this morning and she hoped her antics hadn't thrown him off on his first day. Ola and Michael had met at a media networking event for Black Brits three years ago. They hit it off immediately. She'd been pleasantly surprised when he asked her out a week later, announcing her impending date to the group chat with a Facebook picture of him. NGL, he's buff, Ruth offered. He looks like he played drums at church, Celie added, and they're the worst of all. They admitted he was gorgeous, at least, Michael was even taller than Ola at six foot two, with almond-shaped eyes and flawless skin. He was well-dressed, never without a thin gold chain, and a small hoop earring that his mum hated and Ola adored. 
His looks were all her friends agreed on. Celia and Ruth weren't ever sure anyone Ola liked was good enough for her. But Ola liked the way she felt around Michael. Looser, less herself, but more herself. He was street smart, <laughs> funny and kind. At least the girls were hands-on with the wedding planning. Her phone began to vibrate again. The name Frankie W. flashed furiously on the screen. This confirmed it. She had seriously messed up. The storm came minutes after she arrived in the office, when her phone finally granted her access. The first four messages were from Celia and Ruth. Characteristically animated, Ruth's read, Emergency! You've been on Twitter! Have you seen the list? Celia's message, short and direct like her, consisted of four words. Are you okay, Ola? It was Michael Corating's first day at Curated when the list dropped online. That morning, he'd woken up before his alarm. Michael was alert despite the late night. He hadn't gone anywhere near as hard as Ola, who he'd had to fireman carry into an Uber home. Michael could feel himself smiling at the thought of his soon-to-be wife. Out of the few billion potential soulmates on the planet, he knew his could only be Ola Olajide. They'd been through a lot, him and Ola, but today, Michael hoped, would be the first day of proving he deserved her. Michael reached for one of the few fitted collared shirts he owned and a pair of black trousers. He knew he'd be a touch overdressed for the notoriously laid-back startup, but he couldn't shake off the scornful voice of his mother. He was about to make his way down to the kitchen, but the moment the screen lit up on his phone, he knew something was wrong. 21 missed calls, 59 WhatsApps. His stomach churned. Who had died? No messages from his mum, but he opened a message from Ola's best friend, Celie, who had posted six question marks followed by a link. Michael tapped it, launching his Twitter app, which opened to an account at underscore the underscore list. He frowned as he read the bio. Exposing the UK media's most prolific abusers. Michael's mood shifted from anxiety to confusion. What did this have to do with him? The page was captioned, our response. Thank you to all who submitted. We created this account as official channels continue to fail survivors of abuse in the media and entertainment industries. This account will be deactivated after 24 hours. Michael's mouth was dry. Surely he couldn't be... He took a deep breath before clicking on the spreadsheet and recognised his name immediately. There he was, number 42, wedged between a TV producer accused of date rape and a journalist who preyed on teenage girls. Michael, then, curated, was next to the words, harassment, threatening behaviour, physical assault at office Christmas party with restraining order in brackets. His first thought was, I'm going to lose the first job I've wanted before I even start it. He looked at the growing responses to the post. It was hard to keep track, the jurymen multiplying with each scroll. He'd woken up less than an hour ago as the newest presenter of Tasted. He was now going to work as a named industry abuser. He needed to speak to Ola. He tapped her name, knowing she wouldn't be able to answer because of the blocking app. After one ring, it disconnected. Ignoring the other messages, he typed a reply to Celie. This is not true. I need to talk to Ola ASAP. Celie's online status changed to the default stickman silhouette. She'd blocked him. The thumping in his chest was beginning to affect his breathing. He and Ola were getting married in a month, at least they were supposed to be. This list of abusers would turn any woman's stomach but Ola? This was the kind of thing she'd spent her career documenting. Now he was the type of man she wrote about. 
he sat on the edge of his bed to steady himself. When he slowly got to his feet, he took a deep breath and left for work. All eyes were on him as he stepped into the office. Michael couldn't pinpoint if it was because he was new, black, or because his colleagues had already seen the list. The curated office space was sleek, Instagram chic. He was welcomed by neon signs that shouted slogans like hustle and level up. At the back was a dimly lit recording booth. Michael! He heard the booming voice of Beth Walker, curated's HR manager. She was grinning at him, her smile decorated with a near-neon shade of orange lipstick. We are so excited you're finally joining us. Excited? Okay. So she hasn't seen it yet, Michael thought. Michael was well aware of how his hiring had come about. In late December last year, the social media manager tweeted a photo of their Christmas party to curated 656.4k followers. The image of the entirely white 26-person team quickly went viral, spurring on a hashtag not rated hashtag. Some months and two further hashtags later, Michael was joining the team to present their bi-weekly culture and lifestyle show, Tasted, on YouTube. Such exciting times, Beth exclaimed. Let's go and say hello to Seb, shall we? Curated CEO and editor Sebastian Fraser looked exactly as he did in his pictures, like a member of the Conservative Party's youth wing. He was a more corporate beast than his colleagues, wearing a pinstripe shirt and very clean brown Oxford shoes. Mike, mate, he said, hands outstretched to shake. Big fan of court slipping. You and your mates are absolute lads. Hoping you can bring some of that banter to curated, yeah? He nodded for emphasis. Glad to have you on board. Thanks, Michael said, hoping Sebastian didn't notice the dampness of his hand as he shook it. I'm sure Beth has told you already, but we're one big family here at Curated. All we care about is making things happen. Your things. You guys are the brains. So I hope you're ready. Now, mate, let's introduce you to the rest of the gang. Michael was introduced to a stream of Jacks and Katies and Emmas and Toms, whose faces and roles all began to blur. He spent most of his morning in a silence that he hoped they would put down to nerves. Trying to think of anything other than the list was proving impossible. Instead of getting to grips with the editing software, he was flicking through a mental Rolodex of every single girl he'd ever dated, ghosted, cheated on. Before he'd met Ola, He'd broken hearts, dented women's self-esteem. He shuddered, aware that many exes left in his wake thought he was a dirtbag. But to what degree? His phone was vibrating. Oh la la, flashed across the screen. Michael answered on the first ring. Ola, he said, nearly breathless with relief. Hey. Her voice was quiet. Sorry you've been trying to get hold of me. I guess you've seen... Can we talk? Michael paused. Did he detect fear in her voice? Sure. He wiped his damp brow with his sleeve. Is the pret manger by Victoria Station all right? I can meet you there for lunch. Okay, see you then. Cool. Hey, Ola, I hope you know... She'd already hung up. Michael got up and grabbed his backpack from the back of his chair hurtling into Beth on his way out. Where are you off to in such a hurry? She asked, grinning. Sick of us already? Yeah, I mean, no, sorry. Meeting my girl for lunch. Ah. Oh. She held her hands to her chest in mock adoration. Don't you just love love? The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson, read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 2 In this episode, 
The significance of the list begins to register with Ola when she is asked to write an article about it. And Michael asks Ola to trust him and give him time to clear his name from the accusation of harassment, threatening behaviour and physical assault. Ola, 26 days to the wedding. Ola's head was spinning thanks to her hangover, so the significance of the list was slow to register. She scanned the names, over 60 of them. Some sparked a flicker of recognition. Pappy Danks, Afro-swing up-and-comer. His family had gone to Seeley's church. Next, she spotted Lewis Hale, football legend, regular on The One Show. Lewis was a household name. He didn't seem the type. But she knew better than to think there was ever a type. She continued to read, and her stomach lurched violently as her eyes landed on entry number 42. How could Michael be on there? Her Michael. She felt dizzy as she considered the words that followed his name. Harassment, threatening behaviour, physical assault. She ran up the flight of stairs to the toilets above. Once inside a cubicle, she took out her phone and scrolled. She imagined the Twitter DMs being exchanged at her expense. Ola's man's on here, you know. Mad thing. CEO of Minx are trash. Twitter. No way. British Obamas are done out here. Could she really blame anyone for thinking that? She had dedicated the best part of a decade to railing against patriarchy, rape culture and toxic masculinity. She wasn't the type of person to miss the red flags. Her hashtag MC's two investigative piece exposed abuse allegations against men in the music industry. All those women who'd written to her after hashtag MC's two went viral. What would they think of her? She felt herself doubling over as if sucker-punched in the gut. In a month's time, she was getting married to a man who she apparently didn't know. When she returned to her chair, still trembling, she noticed a notification in the corner of her screen. It was a message from Frankie, who was now in her office squinting at her computer. Can we have a quick chat? FWXXX. Before, her morning bollocking, courtesy of Frankie, had felt like a life-or-death matter. Now, it was merely something she needed to get out of the way. Yeah, I'll be down in five. Ola could see Frankie's furrowed brow over the top of her screen as she opened the door. You wanted to see me? Ola said. Ah, oh, Ola, yes, fab. Take a seat. Were you having phone issues this morning? Passive aggression was the lingua franca of the Wimix offices. Yeah, my bad, Ola said too fast. I downloaded this app that locks me out of my phone until 9.30. I see, clever clogs, Frankie said, voice chirpy, face still tight. Mm, for future reference, can you make sure you loop me in with things like that? Don't worry, I'm uninstalling it ASAP, Ola said, trying to keep her voice even. Frankie leaned forward. No worries, Ola, I get it. I'd have to download it myself if I wasn't in charge. Frankie Webb was so casually audacious, you almost had to respect it. Despite her moneyed background, she could graft like a market trader on Petticoat Lane, had impeccable taste and a keen eye for branding. In 2014, she launched Wominx, a woman's sexual health platform turned lifestyle brand that released an agenda-setting digital issue every quarter. So, Frankie said, you can probably guess why I've pulled you in for a chat this morning. Yes, and I'm really sorry about the delay, Ola cut in, desperate for the conversation to conclude. I promise I'll have it for tomorrow. Frankie looked confused for a moment and then howled with sudden realisation. Forget about the Dutch dildos, woman. We need to report on the list. Ola stared at Frankie dumbstruck. Frankie continued, voice low as if gossiping. OK, so the list went live this morning. Sleazeballs and predators all outed. I know this is very much up your street, so I'm putting you on it. 
You did such a great job with MCs too. I'm sure you'll have no problem with getting survivors to tell their stories. If you could send me a rough pitch by this afternoon, that would be amazing. At times, Ola felt bad about how little she divulged about her personal life at work. But in this moment, Ola was reassured that she'd been right in maintaining her distance. Frankie didn't have a clue that Michael had been named. She probably didn't even remember the name of her fiancé. Ola found a smile for her. Sure thing, she said, nodding. I'll send you an outline by two. She had to keep it together, just for now. She needed to find out the truth. The post had climbed to 4,957 retweets and 8,003 likes by the time Michael arrived at Pret. He spotted Ola in a far corner, drumming her nails against the table. He mustered a muffled, hey, as he pulled out the chair to sit. Ola, this is crazy, man, he began. I actually can't believe. Stop, please, she said, cutting him off. Michael. I just want to know, honestly, why is your name on there? Michael slumped forward over the small table. Though he'd prepared for this, he was surprised at how hurt he felt by her question. You can't expect me not to ask. For my own safety? Ola said. Michael coughed. Safety? Jesus, Ola. Of course he knew that he should tell her the truth but doing so would seal their fate entirely. And the truth hurts, doesn't it? So he lied. I swear to you, on both our lives, Michael said. I don't know why I'm on there. I'm just as rattled as you are. I've never hit, threatened or harassed a woman in my life. You know me, Ola. And what about this assault at a Christmas party? When was that? What office have I ever worked in to go to an office Christmas party, Ola? Since graduation, he'd worked at the Apple store in Oxford Circus and then managed a shoe in Stratford Westfield. His hiring at Curated had been off the back of a podcast called Slipping, he and his friends Quabs and Amani produced. It says someone has a restraining order against you. I know, I've been reading about this. Someone can't have a restraining order against you without you knowing. I have never, ever had the court issue me one. I would never hurt you. You know that. I don't, Ola squeaked, her voice breaking. It's scary, Michael. I don't want to be one of those women who thinks that just because you haven't hurt me, you couldn't hurt... She stopped. Her words stung, but Michael did his best to appear reasonable. Trust the man you are going to marry over an anonymous person on the internet. That's all I ask. Ola nodded, stony-faced. Michael fell back into his seat, deflating with relief. He leaned over to place his hand on hers. She flinched. We're going to need some time. Oh, Michael said. When you say time, I didn't say I'm calling off the wedding, she said clinically. I want to believe you, but I need time. And then there's work stuff too. Work stuff? Silence. Frankie wants me to write a piece on the list, she said. Michael's jaw dropped. She doesn't know you're on there. Given your involvement, I can't, obviously. I need to think about how to handle this. You've got to be joking, Michael said fear catching in his throat. How about telling her the list is bullshit? He'd lost his cool now. Wimminx is a feminist magazine. We write about things like this, Ola said. Even if it's unverified and could ruin lives, he hissed. I can't be responsible for silencing the voices of the women who contributed, Ola said. I only know what I want to believe about you. What you want to believe about me? he repeated, scoffing. It's not like you've always been honest with me, is it? Ola snapped. Michael knew that was coming. I've made mistakes, I know, he said, wary of further provoking her. 
mistakes we agree to move on from. But I'm not that guy anymore. I'm definitely not this guy. Ola was picking at the corner of her acrylic. He tried to find comfort that she was still wearing her engagement ring. If you can't prove to me that none of this happened, Michael, the wedding is off. Ola, 25 days to the wedding. You look like an angel, beamed the bridal shop assistant as she zipped up Ola's wedding dress. But it's ever so slightly loose in the middle. I'll get some pins to see if it's worth us taking in. Are you sure you're all right? Celie said once the door of the boutique clicked shut. You look exhausted. Because I am exhausted, said Ola. They hadn't been there half an hour and she was already desperate to leave. I'm not going to lie. I'm rattled, said Ruth. I mean, a month before the wedding. Ola shook her head. I've no idea whether it can even go ahead. Since yesterday, Ola had been desperate to see Ruth and Celie for some sort of guidance. She quickly realised how naive she'd been to think they'd be able to help. Ruth Nadi never stepped out in less than her birthday girl makeup, doubling as a mobile advert for her services as a part-time makeup artist and lash technician. Celestina Celie Temby, meanwhile, was a Proverbs 31 woman. Her formative years had been spent bashing Bibles, and though less zealous now, the piety never left her. She worked at a plucky indie publishing house. If this was one of us, Celie said stiffly, you'd be the first with your placard out, shouting about complicity in internalised misogyny. What's the difference? Other than, say, the twenty-odd grand you've put down for the wedding. The barb hit Ola where it hurt. First of all, it's not about the money, Ola said. Secondly, I told you... Michael has to prove that he didn't do anything. Then why are we here? Because if I cancel it, it's cancelled, Ola said. That can't be undone. I need some time to think. Celie reached upward and gave Ola's shoulder a gentle squeeze as they both gazed mournfully at her reflection in the mirror. What Michael has been accused of is serious. Staying with him could be dangerous. Ola felt a twinge in her stomach. He's never been violent with me, Celie. Not even close. Does that mean he never could be, her friend said. And even if he isn't, a lot of women survivors will be disappointed that you, of all people, are choosing to stand by someone like that. Come on, Celie. Let's change the subject, please, Ola said. I don't like talking about it like this. It's coming out all wrong and making me sound like an apologist. Celie shrugged and looked at her shoes. Well, if it walks like an apologist and talks like an apologist, Ruth interrupted, voice raised. Low her, man! It's Ola! And you know I'm not Michael's number one fan. But doesn't he deserve a chance to prove himself? I didn't say that, Celie half whispered. I said that this approach, acting like nothing has happened, is insane. Celie, the invites have already gone out, Ola spluttered. The reception venue, booked, the caterers, the DJ, the live band, all paid for. Nigerian weddings were big. Nigerian Ghanaian hybrid weddings for insta-famous accidental influencer couples were huge. Ola hesitated, almost embarrassed to say what she felt. At the end of the day, this is the man I love. You do understand that if I call it off, that's essentially me saying that I think he's guilty. And if you go ahead with it, that's you saying that he's innocent, said Celie. At that moment, Ola's phone began vibrating on the plush velvet footstool. Hey, Ola, any updates on interviewees? Frankie, XX. On my day off, Ola raged. Infuriated, she kicked the stool. Celie and Ruth exchanged worried glances.
The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson, read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 3. In this episode, Simon, the social media manager at Curated, makes a discovery and Michael begins to realise who might have put him on the list and why. Michael, 19 days to the wedding. Michael and Ola sat next to each other in the lawyer's office, their bodies not touching. Okay, so what you're saying is we... Ola corrected herself quickly. He can't sue Twitter for this. That's right. The lawyer, Gary Deacon, said, since the list came down before Twitter were aware of it, there's no offence. Ola's phone flickered for a moment next to her. She studied the notification and then nodded back at him. Got it. And since Michael doesn't know who posted it, Mr. Corating would have to obtain a Norwich Pharmacal Court order which will compel a third party to disclose. Michael began to zone out. Yesterday, the manager of a budding black British actor had called Q-rated to pull him out of their interview at the last minute. No explanation, no apologies. A lot of people were disappearing on him. It's incredibly hard to trace a posting to a particular individual, Gary continued. He adjusted his tie. It's not cheap either. The words hung in the air. Michael could hear Ola's measured breathing, her crossing and uncrossing her legs. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw she was picking at the cuticle of her now bare ring finger. The least you could do is concentrate, Ola seethed as they left the office, rummaging through her bag to retrieve her iPhone. Ola, I let you ask the questions because you wanted to. Ola didn't reply. You keep checking your phone, Michael said. She huffed. Okay, and so what if I do? I have a job and concerned friends and Twitter trolls and a wedding that may or may not be happening, so yes, my phone is a bit busier than usual. He paused. You're right. I'm sorry. When Michael proposed ten months ago, he'd captioned the image of them, sun-kissed and kissing against a sunset. Hashtag black love. Not only for discoverability, but as a declaration. Next thing he knew... He and Ola's faces were plastered on Instagram pages between pictures of Beyonce and Jay-Z and the Obamas. Are you still going to the police station? Ola said. Michael jerked a shoulder upward. The police? They're not exactly well known for having black men's best interest at heart, are they? Yeah, well, you'd probably only be worse off if you were a woman trying to report a rape, Ola snapped. Michael shrunk back and Ola's voice softened slightly. I mean, it can't hurt. She jutted her chin out at him as a sort of goodbye and walked away. The policeman at Plasto Police Station scratched his head. I'm very sorry, Mr. Corating, but this appears to be a civil matter, not a police one. Please, man, is there nothing you guys can do? I'm supposed to be getting married in two and a half weeks. My girl can't even look at me. There isn't a named accuser. Michael's foot began to tap. There's been other stuff too. Other stuff? Yeah. He cleared his throat. I'm being harassed online. Saying it made him feel stupid. It didn't sound serious. It has started with one or two comments from the same account at Mirarisa92. A number small enough that Simon, the social media manager at Curated, was able to delete them as they came in. Platforming woman beaters, are we, curated? Do the right thing by women and sack Michael Corating now. Simon assumed it was one slightly unstable basement dweller who developed a fixation on their handsome new hire. Then, a few hours later, came another comment. Each time he deleted an account, it reincarnated under a variation of the same screen name. And this... Mirarisa92 account. Do you have any idea who's behind it? It's anonymous, Michael said, but I think it's the same person who put me on the list. Michael had never meant what he'd said to Jackie, but he was now certain that Jackie wanted to show him the damage words can do. Ola, 15 days to the wedding. 
So, what you're telling me is that you still have nothing to show me? Ola's fingers hovered over the keyboard. Holding her nerve was crucial. Her boss, Frankie, had messaged in the main Slack chat, where all staff could see the exchange. Ola, I'm really sorry. I admit my planning has been poor. Frankie, poor? It's been a shit show! Frankie's patience was wearing thinner than Ola had ever seen. Ola, I don't want to submit something subpar, so just need a little bit more time. Ola had hired a private investigator called Luke to follow Michael and look into his social media. So far, all he'd sent was the world's most boring background check and blurry pictures of Michael on his lunch break. Frankie, this is so disappointing! Ola, I promise you, uh, I'll get you something by tomorrow. This won't happen again. Frankie, that's right. It won't. Because Kieran's taking over. Kieran was the only person Ola considered a friend at Wimix, where they both worked from its inception. Ola felt conscious about her role as the black one, but after Kieran came out, Frankie joked that she could have single-handedly filled Wimix's diversity quota since Kieran was pansexual, British Indian and dyspraxic. Kieran was in the kitchen area when Ola found her, airpods in, filling her sustainable water bottle. Auntie, Kieran said. The nickname was a way of ribbing Ola about their age gap. I just got a message from Frankie saying that she wants me to take over the list. Wise beyond her years, Kieran was a formidable journalist. She also put her money where her feminist morals were, volunteering at women's shelters on weekends. I don't think anyone should write anything on the list yet. Kieran tipped her head back in confusion. Why not? I know one of the men accused, Ola said. It's Michael. Whoa, Kieran said after a moment. Frankie doesn't know. Right, okay, Kieran said. She was quiet for a moment. But I really hope this isn't you telling me you're standing by an abuser. Kieran, Ola looked at her with pleading eyes. I can't say he is an abuser. Oh, my days, Kieran said. Ola felt her face burn with shame. I'm not saying we never write about it. I'm just saying we hold off. Straight women are at it again, Kieran muttered under her breath. Weakest links. You're not being fair, said Ola, her voice cracking. None of this is fair, Kieran said. Should the stories of all the other women be discarded? Most of the men probably did something to end up on there. That doesn't change because you share a John Lewis gift list with someone. I'm doing my best to find out. Ola paused and bit her lip. I hired a private investigator. Kieran's eyes and mouth became wide. What? He's not found anything yet, but I can't have him stop, can I? Ola said quietly. It was becoming a battle to get her words out. Before she knew it, Ola was sobbing uncontrollably. Kieran handed her two sheets of kitchen roll, rocking Ola's shoulder with her free hand. OK, what is it you actually want from me? Kieran said. I just want some more time before the peace goes out. <laughs> Please. Ola realised she was shaking. I'll speak to Frankie, Kieran said. I'm not going to stop it, but I will hold it off. I don't trust cis men, auntie, but I do trust you. <sighs> Michael better be telling the truth. Michael, 13 days to the wedding. It took longer than Michael expected to get the email he'd been dreading. The list had come down two weeks ago, but it was clear that it had reached his curated colleagues. He'd noticed conversations petering out when he entered the kitchen. It had only been a matter of time until his inbox finally pinged with a message from Beth that afternoon. Subject line, the list, meeting request. The truth is, we were notified about your presence on it the day you arrived, she said, after a sip of tea. We did a DBS check as standard before you got here. There was no restraining order. Nothing. 
In an instant, every single interaction they'd had was reframed. I did make some calls to your past jobs for good measure too, she said. They said they don't even have Christmas parties. And so we assume that the allegations aren't true. Correct? She scanned his face. Correct. We hoped it would die down eventually, but with these comments, some of your colleagues have expressed discomfort, and that puts us in a more compromised position. Right, Michael said. So what does that mean? The silence that followed felt endless. He could almost hear the ticking of her thought process. How could she resolve this in a way that appeared the least problematic? How about you take some time off, she said. Temporary leave till we know how to move forward. Paid, don't worry. With just under three months left of probation, Michael was incredibly worried. But instead, he said, Okay, cool. Thanks, Beth. Once Michael got home, he poured himself a very large glass of Jack Daniels. He decided he was going to tell his friends about the list. For days, the group chat had continued as normal. Nobody had asked why he'd been AWOL, assuming he was tied up with wedding planning. Michael's friends hadn't mentioned the list because they hadn't seen it. It had gone viral in a section of the internet they didn't frequent. He opened the group chat and sent a screenshot with the words, Someone's put me on this. Read it. The typing notifications came to a halt, all at once. There were four of them in the chat. He and Amani had gone to the same secondary school in Canning Town and met Sheon and Quabs at university. It had been right after graduation that they'd started their podcast, Caught Slipping. Amani, this is bonkers, bro. Sheon, is this meant to be someone's idea of a joke or gotta get a lawyer involved, bruv? Michael, already tried, even went to the feds, they can't do nothing. Sheon, well obviously the feds weren't going to do nothing, but it's defamation, I swear. Bruv, I'm seeing Lewis Hell on here, this is looking like one setup. I can't lie. A separate WhatsApp notification popped up from Quabs. Quabs, could this be the work of, you know who? Michael, Jay. Quabs, yep. Michael, I know it's her, who else? Quabs, bruv, this is why I told you to lock that shit off. Michael, I know. Before me and Ola got engaged, I had her blocked across everything. I knew she was upset, but not to the point where she'd do this. He and Ola hadn't been together long. It was back when he was working in retail. Finding his feet in presenting took longer than either of them cared to remember. He knew Ola thought she could do better. Jackie was different. She thought he was smart, funny, somebody. Jackie had been an early court slipping listener and sent a few dozen like notifications. But Michael was cautious, responded to her thirst traps in private DMs, flame emojis for her eyes only. But that all changed when he gave her his WhatsApp. When Jackie started getting serious about leaving her boyfriend, Michael began to ice her out. She'd text repeatedly call him non-stop, leaving hysterical voice notes shrieking about Mikey this, Mikey that. Then, a few weeks later, a missed call at 2am, followed by a rambling message, different from the others. Scary. Something in her must have snapped. But all of this, more than a year later? Adding him to the list? It was hard to believe she hated him this much. Michael's phone vibrated with a new message. Quabs. You know I'm here if you need to talk, yeah? Michael, appreciate you, bro. Michael turned off his phone. As he took another swig from his glass, he drew back his left fist, punching the wall as hard as he could. The List Written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. Read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 4 In this episode, Ola's private investigator discovers a person who is behind the creation of the list, and Ola sets out to meet her, 
but will it leave her with more questions than answers? Hola. 11 days to the wedding. Despite failing to find incriminating evidence about Michael, Ola's private investigator, Luke, had finally come good. By way of some sort of dark web magic, Luke had traced the creator of the list. And in good time, too. Ola was yet to confirm or call off the wedding, with a week and a half to go. The list's creator was Rianne McIntosh, deputy political editor at The Observer. It hadn't been easy to get in touch with her, but after much pestering from Kieran, she'd agreed to an anonymous interview with Womix in order to control an already out-of-hand narrative. Rianne was sat at the bar of a women-only members' club. She was paper-pale with her hair scraped into a low bun. As she approached, Ola felt a faint bitterness towards her. This woman who'd ruined her life in a way too abstract for her anger to be fully realised. They exchanged curt hellos and shook hands. So, what do you want to talk about? The list more generally? Or specifically, your fiancé? Rianne said. Ola must have looked like she was about to keel over. That wasn't some kind of trick question, by the way, Rianne said. I know who you're engaged to. A familiar apprehension began to rise in Ola's chest. Who else knew? Did Frankie? Was this all part of a plan to call her out on Twitter? Look, there are people who want to do me serious harm. I have to vet anyone before I meet them, thoroughly, Rianne continued coolly. When's the big day? It had been stupid of her to think Rianne wouldn't work it out. She was a journalist, after all. But it threw Ola, as it usually did when anyone outside of the other dark web, black Twitter, the hashtag black love Instagram hashtag, was aware of her relationship and surreal online fame. 8th of June. But I'm not 100% sure what's happening with that, Ola said shortly. Rianne blew a long, drawn-out whistle. You're cutting it fine, aren't you, man? When do you plan on making your mind up? The altar? I don't have a plan, if I'm honest, Ola said. And that's why I'm here. Rianne cleared her throat. I did assume there might be more to this than the interview. I need you to tell me who put Michael's name on the list, Ola said. Rianne took a small, deliberate sip from her sparkling water. I can't do that, I'm afraid. The anger Ola felt was sharp. The woman had made the past two and a half weeks of her life unbearable, no matter how noble her motives. OK, Ola said, attempting to keep her cool. Why? Because I don't know who put him on there, Rianne replied. You've no way of accessing anything that could be helpful. For my safety. Rianne shook her head. Even if I did have that information... I can't say that it would be right to give it to you. I have to consider the safety of the survivors too, she paused. I'm assuming you believe he's innocent, Ola chewed at the inside of her cheek. I'm not sure, she said. That's why I'm here. According to Michael, she should be by now. Apparently curated had confirmed... There was no evidence of a restraining order found on his DBS. Am I right in thinking you've written about this kind of thing before? MC's too was you, right? said Rianne, sounding almost bored. Yeah, Ola had been so proud of hashtag MC's too. Now it felt like evidence of her own duplicity. But you know as well as I do... How important fact-checking is, verification, sources. Rianne looked unmoved, curling her lips slightly. Well, we have that belief in common, she said. That's why I made the list in the first place. I only sent it to nine people. All of them in the industry, all of them trustworthy. 
We agreed they should only send it to people they trusted. And then it just got bigger and bigger and harder to control. Well, it would, Olla said, sounding more snide than she'd intended, since you put it on Twitter. I didn't, Rianne said. Some women decided to go public with it. You can't really own something like that. It was only live for two days. But soon it was no longer just listing male journalists. I started to panic. The spreadsheet wasn't password protected as I hadn't thought it needed to be. By the time it had reached Twitter and I saw it being casually referred to as a rape list, I started having trouble sleeping. Ola pulled a sceptical face. How could you have not foreseen the obvious risk of it being manipulated? Of course I knew there were risks, Rianne said. For the first time she looked uneasy. The usual slut-shaming and gaslighting. But uh, I don't think that pain necessarily trumps the pain of survivors. The vast majority of these types of allegations are true. Look... I believe women, Ola said, but false allegations being rare doesn't make them impossible. If I told you it might be a racist who put Michael on there, would he be deserving of white liberal sympathy then? It was clear Rianne was thinking very carefully about what to say. All I can say is that I didn't do it maliciously or lightly. A lot of these men have money. The worst that could happen isn't them walking free. It's them suing their accusers. And since I made it, I'd be number one on that list. Ola felt grimy all over. Rianne shouldn't be sued by men she hadn't even accused herself. But she couldn't help but think again of the last time she'd seen Michael. An entirely broken man. Michael had stopped texting, stopped talking, gone into himself. Don't you regret any of it? If one woman is proven to be lying, we all become liars, Rianne sighed. If some bloke decides to off himself because of this, then it becomes about how feminism is killing innocent men, despite the countless innocent women who've lost their lives at the hands of abuse. That's why I might regret parts of it, but I don't regret it itself. Ola always knew that the list had been made with good intentions. I have to get back to the office, Ola said. After a few seconds of silence, she rose to leave. You know, before my ex hit me, I would have never believed he could, Rianne said. Just look after yourself, yeah? Ola returned a feeble smile and a nod before making her way out of the bar. As she stepped into the foyer, Ola's iPhone let out a fleeting vibration of a text from a withheld number. I don't know who submitted Michael, but they did it under the name at Mirrorissa92. Turning on her heels as fast as she could, Ola raced back up the stairs. It was too late. Rianne McIntosh was nowhere to be seen. Michael, seven days to the wedding. Michael waited for a bus. He hadn't even bothered putting his hood up in the drizzle, though his uncut hair was now sodden. Ola had sent him a curt text last night to say that the wedding cloth for his mum's dress had arrived at her flat, and he quickly offered to pick it up. It was an excuse to see her. When the 115 arrived, Michael trudged upstairs and folded himself into a corner at the back. Quabs had threatened to come round to visit, but Michael had managed to convince him it wasn't necessary. If Quabs had made it to his flat, he'd see the drained bottles of alcohol and the dirty plates that lay across the floor. Michael clicked on the teacup icon in his web browser. He held his breath. Relief flooded through him as it opened. No new posts about him on All Tea No Crumpet. The spotlight was now on a YouTuber called That Guy Abbey, who took a polygraph test he claimed would prove his innocence. All Tea was Britain's biggest black gossip forum, 
and boasted hundreds of thousands of followers. Their currency was scandal. When Ola opened the cream-coloured door to her flat, Michael was taken aback. She looked emaciated in an enormous black hoodie of his, still no ring on her finger. Hey, Michael said softly. She nodded in response. He wanted to hug her so badly, but Ola was stony-faced and silent. Her eyes widened at his appearance momentarily. Everything about him looked worn and crinkled, his uncharacteristically dry skin, greyish and ashen. She didn't ask him to come in and Michael didn't offer to. Instead, Ola wordlessly passed him the bag with his mum's wedding cloth in it, and in doing so, her hand grazed the scab forming across the front of his knuckles. Instantly, she pulled it towards her. What did you do to your hand? He let her trace it with her fingers, just so he could feel her. I tripped over on my way to the corner shop the other day. She looked at him quizzically, unable to hide her worry. It was a welcome reminder that she still cared about him. How's work? he said. He needed to keep her on the doorstep. She dropped his hand. It's fine, thanks. We're not doing the list article, by the way, if that's what you're wondering. Something inside him slowly uncoiled. Yeah, Ola murmured. Frankie wanted Kiran to write it instead, but there are still a lot of questions. Rah, swear down. He blew out of his mouth. I can't lie, I'm surprised. I'm happy you lot did the right thing, though. Ola bristled at the right thing. Yeah, well, it's not like Frankie said it's never going to happen. Well, let's hope it doesn't come to that. She took a small step backward. You hope we aren't able to warn people about abusers in the industry? Ola, that's not what I'm saying. Michael placed his hands on her shoulders, forgetting himself. I don't know how to talk about this to you. I feel like I'm always saying the wrong thing. Ola looked up at him with softness he hadn't seen in weeks. Same. It's impossible. For the first time in a long time, Michael felt Ola could see him. See the Michael she'd said yes to, not the supposed abuser. He sighed deeply. What are we going to do, man? I don't know, Michael. He tutted. I really thought the biggest challenge we'd face at this wedding was which Jolof to serve. Ola rolled her eyes and smiled. You're so dumb. They both laughed weakly. Michael gave her shoulders a light squeeze. You know I wouldn't do those things, Ola, right? Please tell me you know that I'm not a bad one. Her large eyes shone almost immediately and as her lips parted, he heard a phone vibrate in a tracksuit pocket. She reached for it, writhed out of his grip, and studied the screen intently. I have to go. Oh. He couldn't hide his disappointment. Right now? Yep. Next thing he knew, Michael was facing the front door of her flat. It all happened so quickly, the exchange over before it began. But he'd felt it that shift in the atmosphere after she read her phone, her exterior hardening, the drawbridge going back up. Michael began walking briskly back to Tooting Broadway Station. He fished his phone from his pocket and opened the list page on all T. The account at Mira Risa 92, the very same Jackie, would comment on all T now and then, chiming in with the abuse and calls for action. He scrolled, Till he found her last comment. That gap tooth narcissist Michael K must be held accountable for his treatment of women. R.I.P. Michael K, the evil that you have done is enough. I know who you are, he typed slowly. Why did you put Michael Korateng on the list? Send. He exited the site and picked up his pace.
The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson, read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 5. In this episode, Ola is shocked and upset when she hears another woman's story of sexual abuse. Meanwhile, wedding guests are beginning to fly in from abroad. Ola, five days to the wedding. Talking to Rianne had made the list unbearably real. The woman who contributed to it dominated Ola's thoughts. She decided to show the world that she was indeed a good person. She trawled GoFundMe for causes and gave to eight crowd funds in a row, being sure to tick the Make My Donation Public button. Her anxiety brought her to this community centre, the location of the Womink sponsored panel Kieran was moderating. Kieran had organised it to fundraise for a charity, offering counselling to refugee women. Days before it took place, Ola had contacted Abby, the organiser, about getting involved and had quickly commandeered it entirely. She acquired free booze, a high-profile panellist and merch-filled tote bags. Abby gushed with thanks. We weren't expecting such an amazing turnout, she was saying. I think we've raised over £700. That's incredible, isn't it, Ola? Kieran gave her upper arm a gentle squeeze. They were standing right in the thick of the 40-odd person throng. Ola's eyes had settled on the fire exit. She made it clear earlier she didn't want to stay for the networking segment and was keen to get out of there as quickly as possible. For days, she hadn't been able to shake the image of Michael at her door. He'd look terrible. Eyes hollowed, cheeks gaunt. He reeked of alcohol. Plus, there was that nasty cut to his hand. Abby clicked her fingers in remembrance. Before you get going, I must intro you to our admin assistant, Nor. She wants to get into journalism once she graduates. Massive fan of both of you. Do you mind? Kieran shook her head, and before Ola could protest, Abby had disappeared into the crowd. The room was brimming with journalists, influencers and activists. I just feel like I shouldn't stay, said Ola. The longer I'm here, sooner or later someone is going to bring up the list. Are you guys talking about the list? Nor was by their side suddenly. She couldn't have been more than twenty and had a biblical sort of beauty. Nor? Kieran asked. Yes. And I'm not going to pretend I'm not hugely fangirling right now. Your questions on tonight's panel were just, ugh, perfection. She turned to Ola. I sent my mate your interview with that mindful masturbation instructor yesterday. (laughs) Still one of the funniest things I've ever read. You're gifted. Ola had never felt like such a fraud. Oh, cool, was all she could muster. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nor said, mock bowing. Anyway, were you guys just talking about the list? Ola felt her body go cold. We were. It's definitely caused a much-needed overdue table shake, Kieran offered. For sure. There's someone on it I had a run-in with. Really? Ola piped up. Nor nodded. Do you guys know Matthew Plummer, sports journalist? Ola recognised the name from Twitter. What happened? Kieran asked. Nor stepped closer. When I was in my last year of secondary school, I went to an event he spoke at. Afterwards, he approached me and said we should go outside for a chat. She swallowed. Once we were outside, he saw all over me. I thought I was probably reading too much into it, but then he kissed me. Afterwards, he messaged, saying that he would give me some one-on-one advice over a drink. I told him it wasn't legal for me to drink yet. Ola suppressed a gasp. Matthew Plummer had to be approaching his fifties. The thought of a pubescent gnaw, basically still a baby now, dodging kisses from a fully grown man. Kieran's face was a picture of abject horror. Did you? I didn't go, no, she said. He sent me a dick pic and I blocked him, but I beat myself up over that for years. 
What would Olla have done if the words by Michael's name had been groped underaged girl? I hate how the focus is back on men already, their needs, Nor went on, instead of talking about how we got to the point of needing the list. Kieran shrugged. Patriarchy's gonna patriarch. It makes me feel terrible thinking about how many girls Matthew would have reached out to after me. None of that was your fault, Nor. You were a kid, Kieran said. I was, she said, her voice catching. But I'm not now, she gave a sad smile. After saying their goodbyes, they made their way to the car park and Kieran linked Ola's arm. I'm scared, Kieran, Ola admitted, that I'm part of the problem, that I'm helping make this cesspit of an industry worse for her, for all of us. Ola desperately waited for her friend's assurances to fill the void inside her, but the echoes of the faraway revellers only grew louder, as did the silence between them. Michael, three days to the wedding. As Michael reached arrivals at Heathrow Airport, he rummaged for a piece of gum, hoping it might mask the alcohol in his breath. He squinted at the arrivals board, British Airways, Accra, BA-078, landed. Kweku, his grandmother's voice was unmistakable from across the concourse, standing next to a legion of suitcases. Thankfully, she slept all the way from Heathrow to his parents' house. As they pulled up to his parents, a yellow brick terraced home, he lightly sprayed himself with a cheap deodorant. His mum was out on the doorstep in her dressing gown before he'd even knocked on the door. The women's greeting, a flurry of backpats and swaying hugs. She gestured her hands at Michael's, eyeing him cautiously. His mum noticed whenever something was wrong, but what was wrong with him simply wasn't a discussion they could have. She didn't really understand the internet. Michael quietly dragged his grandmother's bags into the living room. The decor was identical from when he was a child. The once beige couch, now browning, the curtains frayed at the edges. Framed photos of Michael grinned at him from the mantelpiece. Him in reception class all the way to him in his gown at graduation. Soon, wedding photos were supposed to join the gallery. His mother sidled up beside him and placed a small hand around his waist. He turned to pass her the bag he'd brought from Ola's. Two outfit changes for their mums, three for him and Ola. The wedding would be quite the spectacle if it went ahead. His mother stared at him with pursed lips. How many messages must I send for you to reply me? I'm sorry I got distracted with work stuff. She blew air from her nose in something resembling a laugh. So, Kale. The tone of her voice said it most certainly wasn't. Mom, come on, man. I said I'm sorry. I'm not your man, she said dryly. At the start of their relationship, Ola had warned him she knew all about Ghanaian mothers and their sons. In their mum's eyes, they could do no wrong. This was only partly true. As her only child, Michael's mother doted on him but she spent the rest of her time acting like he was the bane of her existence. I should have texted you back, mummy. How could Michael explain that every time his phone vibrated, panic rippled through his body? She peered at him over her reading glasses. How is work? It's all right, he said, not wanting to discuss Q-rated. A video I did went viral. Got over a million views. As he'd suspected it would, his mum's face opened out into a wide smile. We thank God, she said, clasping her hands together. Okay, son, we are proud of you. He knew that later that evening, she'd regale her friends from church on WhatsApp with an exaggerated spiel about his job. You look sick, Kweku. Has Allah been making sure you're eating? We're fine. It's just been a bit hectic. His mother's forehead puckered with concern. You're sure? Kweku, when was the last time you went to church? Mom, 
he said, voice raised. I'm fine. Okay, she said, shushing him. Even though my daughter-in-law doesn't seem to mind that her husband is wasting away. I'm not wasting away, he said calmly, avoiding the plainly laid verbal booby traps as best he could. And Ola, like me, has work to do. You mean that website of hers, that sex shop? For his mother, the fact you could order vibrators from the Wimix site had set its status in stone. When there are so many nice Ashanti girls at church without metal in their nose, she'd lamented. Eventually, Ola grew on her. She liked her as much as she could a Nigerian daughter-in-law. As traditional as she was, her desire for grandchildren superseded her conservatism. You must start trying for children as soon as possible, his mother pleaded. A baby? They hadn't held hands, let alone cuddled in nearly a month. Sex was off the table, obviously. The elephant in bedroom. The one other time they'd stopped having sex was when he and Jackie initially started hooking up in his early days of seeing Ola. Ola had found out. From his perspective, there was debate about whether they were official-official at the time. To this day, he maintained he hadn't been seeing Jackie. Yes, he'd sweet-talked her, declared feelings he didn't necessarily have. But that had been in the moment when they'd been in bed. Jackie had been hysterical after he ended it. Messaging Michael non-stop, DMing quabs, Michael had ignored them all. It amazed him that he'd managed to convince Ola to take him back. When it became clear that he and Ola were patching things up, Jackie had turned her sights on his girlfriend. She bombarded Ola with harassing messages. Ola made Michael swear on both their lives that he'd never speak to Jackie again. But when he lost his job in retail, slowly the insecurities seeped in again. The temptations. He and Jackie rekindled things, yes, but he never touched her. It sounded ridiculous. They'd sent each other nudes, described in explicit detail what they would do to each other if they got the chance. But she had a boyfriend by then too, and they both agreed that was a line they wouldn't cross. The more he thought of telling Ola, the more he felt their brittle union couldn't bear the weight of another betrayal. The rumble of Michael's stomach caught the attention of his mother. She tutted again. At least stay for dinner. There's Waki. He was never going to turn down Waki, even at his lowest ebb. She knew that. Ola, one day to the wedding. Ola pulled her laptop from under the debris of her desk. The rehearsal was in a few hours, and she had no idea how she could face it. She opened Skype. Her sister, Fola, answered after one ring, blurred by the bad connection. Hey, are you almost here? Just touched down in London town, Fola paused. You good? Ola let out a tired exhale. Fola, she said after a moment. I feel really off, man. Listen, I knew it! Ola felt her mouth curl up into a smirk. The ancestors alerted you, girl, she said. Mm -mm, it was my twin senses, Fola went on. Ola and Fola were not twins. They looked alike, but Fola was seven months younger and had a different mother. She'd been raised in Canada. Their dad had travelled regularly on business that plainly extended beyond his work, and Ola's mother had known his secret. Ola struggled to respect her because of this. She loved her father's charisma and humour, but her mother's passivity was something she fought against. Their father had died of cancer, and she and Fola had met for the first time just before the funeral. Fola, like their father, was the embodiment of a sunny morning. Now she was teaching English in Panama. So what's going on? Fola said, leaning into her phone. Do you know how to pronounce your new surname yet? Because I sure as hell don't. I'm not sure if I can do it, Ola said. Wait, you can't do what? Tonight? Tomorrow? Ola nodded silently. 
maybe I should have just ended this when I saw the list. But I love him, Fuller, too much. That makes you human, Fuller said. Her voice was an audible hug. But sis, whatever you choose to do, you have to do something. And fast. The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. Read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 6. In this episode, Michael meets footballer Lewis Hale, who has been named on the list as being violently homophobic and abusive, which he denies. And Ola finds a startling online notification. Michael, one day to the wedding. Michael hastily texted Ola as he made his way to Orpington to meet former Premier League footballer Lewis Hale. Left order of ceremony booklets at mine. Can you bring, please? They're in bag on kitchen counter. He hadn't heard a single update from Ola about the wedding prep. He wondered if she would even reply. As he reached Lewis's driveway, Michael was bowled over. He lived in a manor surrounded by acres of lush foliage. Michael wasn't entirely sure how Lewis had got his number. It was only when Lewis's agent reached out that he realised it was legitimate. Lewis explained that he wanted to have a talk about the list. You want to talk to me? Michael said. No disrespect, but you don't know anything about me. I know a bit about your girlfriend, Lewis said. I'll add a journalist, right? One of the good ones by the looks of it. She writes about some interesting stuff. Lewis started to laugh. I assume if she vouched for you, being a feminist and that, it might be for good reason. Michael's stomach rolled over as he said it. It was probably for the best that Ola didn't know he was meeting him. Lewis. How could he rationalise associating with someone accused of violent homophobia and abuse to her? Lewis was standing at the bottom of large stone steps. Michael, what's happening, son? Lewis said, his face flooding with relief. He extended a hand. Lewis, you're a legend. Michael couldn't help but be a bit starstruck. He knew him from football cards and Black History Month posters at primary school. From 116 goals and 263 appearances for Crystal Palace, Michael and Amani had both worn his number nine shirt. Lewis gave a nervy smile. Appreciate that, mate, he said. Come in. A gargantuan crystal chandelier hung at the centre of the entrance hall. On every wall were portraits of his wife, Samantha. Michael's phone went. It was Ola. She'd reply to his message with a thumbs-up emoji. That was it then. The wedding was happening. Everything good? asked Lewis, noting Michael's perturbed expression. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. Wedding tomorrow. Tomorrow? Michael nodded, hardly believing it himself. Jesus, you need a drink more than me. He pulled two bottles of Guinness from a fridge and set them down on the coffee table in the living room. Thanks for this, mate. Lewis lowered himself onto the couch. He'd been made aware of the allegations of him being violently homophobic and abusive by his team the day the list was published. I never thought it could get worse than in my heyday, but now every paper is a tabloid and their sources. Twitter, he said, heaving a sigh. How'd a nice lad like you end up on there? Or are you a nasty piece of work like the rest of them? Michael fixed his eyes on his bottle and replied. Some girl I was talking to, a fan of my old podcast. I wasn't great to her, but nothing like what's on the list. Lewis gave a knowing look. Does your missus know? Nope. Blur clot! It wasn't physical, Michael felt the need to say. It sounded absurd. Lewis nodded away. It happens, he said, and took another sad swig. Seeing Lewis so cowed 
made Michael feel uncomfortable. It was like watching his dad lose a fight. You know the worst bit for me? Lewis continued. Can't even bloody defend myself, my agent says. Brings more attention to it. It's not true though, is it? Michael said, almost by reflex. Do you think we'd be sat here if it was true about me? Lewis snapped. You sound like every other knobhead on the internet. Lewis sat back in his chair. Sorry, didn't mean to get the arm. He took a cigarette from inside his blazer pocket. I was being defensive because it's complicated. Michael now feared where this was going. So you, he started. Are abusive? Lewis chipped in, putting his cigarette out in the ashtray. Nah, son, definitely not. Homophobic? That could be said, yeah. Call people names during fights, like most blokes my age. But I'm also gay, which probably makes things a bit less straightforward. Michael sat and waited for the sarcastic follow-up, but it never came. Don't worry, mate, you're not my type, Lewis eventually said. The tension in the air, in their bodies, dissipated. He told Michael that he'd been in the closet for the entirety of his upbringing in his Seventh-day Adventist household and his 17-year marriage to Samantha. He'd slept around a lot in his prime, but discreetly. I kept telling myself it was just sex and I love Sam. But then he met Chris and fell for him in an instant. They'd happily seen each other in private for a year and a half. They'd eventually broken things off after Lewis had refused to leave Samantha. Michael's chest was heavy, and now he's put you on the list for revenge. No, Lewis said. Chris would never do that. His junkie sister, on the other hand. Joe wanted 50k to keep her mouth shut. I paid her off ages ago, but now she wants double. And Sam's not stupid. She thinks I have a mistress. This, though... She'd never forgive me. Lewis coughed to clear his throat. Boy, Michael said, lost for words. Have you thought of taking her to court? I have. But it would mean going public with the fact that I've been unfaithful to Sam, with a geezer. Have you thought of... Michael broke off momentarily. Coming out, Lewis said. But if people knew, I wouldn't be me anymore. I just want a normal, peaceful life. With Sam and the kids, I'd lose everything. Yeah, dickheads would chat shit, no doubt. But I'm not sure everyone would turn their backs on you, Michael stressed. You're a legend. That won't ever change. Like, I don't think any less of you now I know. Really? Lewis said. He looked unconvinced. What do you do when your mates make the usual gay bashing jokes? Michael thought of Amani and Sheon. Their coded remarks on the podcast about men who they deemed fruity. And like he had done in those scenarios, Michael said nothing. Lewis gave a curt nod in response. Exactly, he sighed. And that's not me blaming you. I don't say nothing either. Michael's chest began to feel restricted. But what's the alternative? Suffering in silence? Lewis swigged the remainder of the beer. He looked at Michael. That's why I asked you here today, Lewis said with a serenity that worried him. See, I have an idea. A joint statement from us both, accompanied by 15k in charity donations, our pay, of course, and an offer of an exclusive comment to Ola. It's the only way, Michael, to take back control of the narrative. The suggestion set off a flurry of red flags. Michael's concern was as much for himself as for Lewis. He felt certain it would backfire. Michael kept a spare key taped underneath a plant pot. Ola found it and raced up to Michael's bedroom. The air inside was smoky and stale. Cracking open a window, she bent over the open MacBook on his bed and sifted through his Gmail inbox. She typed in, Mirrorissa92. Nothing. She sighed and clicked a tab on his desktop. All tea, no crumpet. 
She hadn't realised they'd had a chat site. Ola braced herself for the comments. O.L. at is a fraud, cosplaying as a feminist, when her man is out here abusing women. O.L. at has to speak up, read another message. It was as if Ola had been physically slapped across both cheeks. She tried to breathe. As she clicked back to the homepage, the urgent red dot of a notification cropped up in the bottom corner. Shakily, she opened it and let out an audible gasp. A message from at Mirarissa92 expanded onto the page. Michael had written to them first. I know who you are. Why did you put Michael Corinting on the list? The response turned the skin on her arms to Braille. Because I can, Mikey X. Ola staggered backwards out of her seat. Michael knew who'd put him on the list. Through the haze of shock, only one thing was clear. Ola couldn't marry Michael. She had to call off the wedding. And she had to do it right now. As her Uber driver pulled into the car park of the church, she practically fell out of the car. Fola stood outside. Ola, you're shaking. I need to speak to Michael. He's inside, with everyone else. Hey, is everything... Right, now. There's the office, on the left, where we dropped the bags. I can tell him to meet you there. Fola gave a worried glance. I'll explain. I promise. Ola said. In the church office, there were two low chairs. She lowered herself onto one. Michael walked in a few minutes later. Yo, Fola said you needed me. You got the booklets. The legs of the chair scraped as he pulled it towards him. We need to talk. Every time you say that, some shit's happened. What is it now? Okay, Ola said, shoring herself up. I'll just say it, Michael. I saw the message you sent on all tea to Mirarissa 92. Horror crossed Michael's face. I went through your laptop, she continued. I needed to know that I'd done everything I could before tomorrow, so who... Her phone was ringing, Luke's name filling the screen. She tried to speak over the noise. Who is Mirarissa 92? Ola pushed on. And their response to your message. Because I can, Mikey. What does that mean? Tell me the truth for once. Michael frowned. Mikey? Oh, there it was. It had to be her. At Marissa 92 was Jackie. No one else called him that clawing nickname except her. Just answer the question! Michael's eyes travelled towards her mobile as it quivered again. He looked at Ola, eyes narrowed. Someone with the username Mirarissa92 has been harassing me for weeks, he said. So I tried to see if I could catch him out. Now he said it, it sounded almost plausible, that he'd been provoking the account into providing some sort of intel. Ola began blinking rapidly. But why didn't you tell me if there was nothing to hide? The phone started to vibrate noisily again. Aren't you going to answer that? Michael said. Before she could stop him, Michael lunged at it. Ola's frenzied attempts to claw it back were in vain. He was already examining the screen. Who's Luke? The chair fell from under her as Ola strained towards the phone. Are you cheating on me, Ola? She stopped to let out a sardonic laugh. Am I cheating on you? How dare you even ask me that? Michael stood up to scroll. What is this? There's pictures of me on my way back from work. A copy of my DBS. Screenshots of my Instagram. Ola! Ola opened her mouth and then closed it. Luke is a private investigator. I've been having you followed. Followed? She nodded. The church office was entirely still. Why are we even doing this? Michael said in time, audibly choked. 
We can't make this work, can we? I hate that you had to do this, man. His shoulders began to shake as he tried to suppress his oncoming sobs. The iPhone vibrated. Michael didn't move as Ola opened the text from Luke. Have to terminate your job from today. Been one month with no progress and I've had another gig come through. Good luck with wedding. As Michael wiped his damp eyes, Ola did the same. Her love for him couldn't simply vanish, despite her best efforts. It had taken a beating, but it was bone deep, instinctual. For a moment, nothing else in the room mattered other than reminding him of that. Ola enclosed her fiancé in her arms, resting her head on his shuddering shoulder, and they held each other. We should get to the rehearsal, Ola said finally. The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. Read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 7. In this episode, The Wedding, Michael is overwhelmed with love. As a guest posts pictures and comments online, one guest announces, talk about my big fat Nigerian wedding. There was a knock on the door of Michael's hotel room. Quabs shuffled inside, wearing a colourful kente cloth draped around the shoulders of his tux. He peered over his aviators. Is the man of the hour, he said with a hint of trepidation. You ready? Michael rubbed his mouth against the back of his hand. As I'll ever be, man. He retrieved a small navy box from his pocket and passed it to Quabs. All right, bro, Quab said. Let's do this. From the church foyer, Michael could hear the warbling of guests in a sea of African clothing. It was as though everyone he'd ever met was packed into the church. Ave Maria began to play. He started his uneasy walk down the aisle, and a galaxy of phone lights greeted him from the church pews. He felt insecure about the candids that would populate hashtag the Corantengs 19, a wedding hashtag Ruth and Seely had insisted on. As he got closer to the altar, he was comforted by the sight of his grandmother and his mother, both in fishtail dresses made of kente. Pastor Oyedepo acknowledged him with a nod. Michael looked back as the bridesmaids and groomsmen entered, Seely, Ruth and Fola in emerald dresses, Amani, Sheun and Quabs like bodyguards with black shades perched on their heads. There was a lull. Then Ola's mother turned the corner. Smiling serenely, she escorted her daughter towards the altar. Ola was walking gracefully white silk gown grazing the floor with a long veil attached to a diamante tiara. With each step forward she took, he became certain this was the most beautiful she'd ever looked. His love for her cut through the distress and anxiety like a knife. Ola faced him, holding both his hands. Pastor Oyadepo cleared his throat and after a series of prayers and blessings, he said, Oya, oh yeah, the moment we've been waiting for. Michael, do you take Olaide Deborah Adebimpe Olajide to be your lawful wedded wife? Whatever it took, whatever they faced, for better or worse. He ran his thumb along hers. I do. Pastor Oyedepo nodded and turned his attention to Ola. She was a picture of disorientation. Her makeup had a sheen of perspiration. Michael gripped her hands tighter 
in silent prayer. And Olaide, Pastor Oyedepo said, Do you take Michael Kweku Koranting to be your lawful wedded husband? After what felt like a lifetime, I do fell from Ola's lips too. They pulled up to the reception venue, a stately Neo-Palladian villa in a park in Bromley. Twinkling tendrils of lights dripped like liquid from the ceiling. Pink, white and gold balloon arches crowded corners. Well-wishers pouted in front of a large flower wall emblazoned with hashtag the Corintings 19 in looping gold letters, while a projector magnified images from the hashtag onto a huge screen. Whoa, she heard Michael say. The decorators went in. Ola nodded. Her heart swelled at the thought of how much effort Ruth and Celie had put into helping her sort it all out. Perfect timing, Quab said as they approached. He was now in a white caftan, his locks sticking out of a pink koofy hat. I'll get the girls, he jogged back into the throng. Amani sidled over to Ola and placed his arm around her shoulders. Mrs. Corenteng, is that you, yeah? She hoped her smile was convincing. Ola wasn't a huge fan of Michael's friends. How does it feel, finally being a wifey? Best day of your life, Amani said. She wished everyone would stop asking her that. From the hall, a succession of amens marked the end of the opening prayer. As the crowd quietened, Quabs came back to the group, followed by the bridesmaids. The voice of the wedding MC, David Ayodo, filled the hall. Abel God by Chinko Ikung began to play. On cue, Ola and Michael's friends dance walked into the hall to delighted whoops. Presenting uh, the newest couple of 2019, Black Excellence Squared, Mr. and Mrs. Corinting, David said before the opening chords of Yori Yori. Michael led, and Ola walked behind him, swaying slightly, the noise and camera flashes drowning out her thoughts. Oya, oh, yeah, shake body, David demanded as the party-goers began to close in. A hand grasped hers, and Ola was swung backwards. Now she was before Michael, rolling her hips against his like she used to when they went raving. They hadn't been this close in a long time. Aye! Love is sweet, oh, David cried. See the way they're dancing. They won't make baby before the honeymoon, Miami. Close your eyes. The crowd erupted. Ola was cornered for congratulations from cousins and friends she hadn't seen since school. She was asked about her pregnancy timeline by elders she'd never met and accosted by complete strangers who'd flown in for the occasion. She thought she'd never escape until David announced the buffet was open. Soon, three quarters of the guest list were standing next to trays, teeming with Kelewele and Borfoot, Joloff and Plantin. Ola stepped into the brisk air of the marquee. By its opening, Foller and Ruth stood gossiping. OK, African Queen, Ruth greeted her. Foller ran her fingers along Ola's sleeve. Did I tell you how incredible you look? God is a black woman for real. Ruth cheersed the air with her glass. You and Celie know how to throw a party, Ola said, eyes scanning the marquee. Oi, do you know where she is? Celie? Nah, probably at an extracurricular Bible study with Pastor. Ola laughed, but reached for her phone regardless and tapped Celie's name into WhatsApp. Yo, where you at? She and Celie had spoken less and less since the news of the list. As the wedding drew nearer, Celie had stopped checking in. Ruth jerked her head towards the back of the marquee. Wait, who's the Oibo? She looks lost. Ola followed her sightline over to an agitated brunette by the gift table. Is that Frankie? 
Ola said. Sure enough, there she was, nursing a Prosecco next to a deeply disgruntled-looking Kieran. Is that your boss? Ruth said. Ah, the Waitrose warrior herself! I need to meet her! As Ola made her way over, Kieran mouthed apologies behind their boss's head. Ola, Frankie said, standing to hug her. Don't you look fabulous? Hope you don't mind me doing a bit of wedding crashing. But I just had to give you my best wishes in person. I did say it was invite only, Kieran murmured. Frankie was examining the table of presents. So, who wins out of you two then? I thought Indian weddings were huge, but talk about my big fat Nigerian wedding. Ola began shouting intros over the music. This is my chief bridesmaid, Ruth. Ruth pulled Frankie into a rocky embrace. I've heard so much about you. Really? Frankie said. I've never heard a thing about you. Ola tells us absolutely nothing. Quickly, Kieran guided Ola towards her. I am so sorry, she hissed. I thought I'd lose her on the tube. It's fine, seriously. I'm glad you're here, Ola said. Does Frankie know about Michael? She knows you and Michael have just had the wedding of the year. That's it. Ola breathed a sigh of relief. It's been a nightmare, Kieran winced. She thought that girl over there was FKA Twigs and was trying to get her for our next cover. She nodded towards a mixed-race woman, whose similarities with FKA Twigs began and ended there. I did not! Frankie's head bobbed between them like a meerkat. Her eyes turned to saucers over Ola's shoulder. Is that who I think it is? Mrs. Corentang. Michael strode towards her, holding up a red velvet cupcake decorated with their faces. Looking good enough to eat. She groaned as he took an exaggerated bite and leaned in for a kiss. Well, I can see why Ola hid you from the Wiminx girls, Frankie said. Where did you guys meet? A dating app specifically for models? Michael laughed awkwardly. Uh, thanks. He interlaced his fingers with Ola's. Can you excuse us for a sec? Your newlyweds. Love's young dream. Enjoy it. I bloody didn't. So when you do throw that bouquet, keep it away from me. As he guided her through the mob, Ola remembered how Michael made her feel taken care of. Protected. For the first time in a month, it was as if they were back on the same team. Michael perched on an empty table by the entrance. Listen, it's speeches in a minute. I just wanted to say, I know I haven't always been the man you deserve, but I love you, Ola, so much. You'll never know how grateful I am that you're letting me show you I do for the rest of our lives. He inched closer to kiss her. The sincerity in his face, the pain of the last month, all crashed in on her at once. For all they might lack, there was no love loss between them. That was one thing the list hadn't taken. They made their way back through the party. Once they reached the top of the marquee, Ola hung back. I just want to check something. Michael nodded and walked over to the high table, where their family sat on throne-like chairs. Rooting around her bag, Ola found her phone. She went straight to her friend Celie's reply to her text. Had to run. Have a headache. Enjoy rest of the night. X. Ola tried to work out what Celie's words really meant. Fuller and Ruth had at least been warm towards Michael, Celie hadn't acknowledged him all day. Ola made her way inside and almost didn't notice Frankie approaching. Mm, are you okay? I'm so sorry, darling, she said. Sorry? For what? Ola was exasperated, preparing herself for the worst. Who had she mistaken for John Boyega? Oh, Frankie pushed a lock of her hair from her face. I just assumed... Because you were on your phone. Frankie, what is it? Ola huffed. Speeches are literally about to start. Frankie looked towards her mobile. Panic shot through Ola instantly. No, 
she thought. Please, God, no, I'm begging you not today. Show me. Her boss's Instagram was open to the hashtag the quarantines, 19 hashtag. The wedding posts had been pushed down by square after square of the same image. Their engagement photo with thick black text across it. Michael Corenting, abuser. Ola Olijade, apologist. Hashtag the Corentings 19. Hashtag couple goals. Hashtag the list. No matter how far she scrolled, it was all Ola could see. She looked up as slack-jawed partygoers studied their mobile phones in shock. A horrified crowd formed around the projector in the hall as the images began dominating the feed on the 120-inch screen. The entire room was witnessing the hashtag takeover unfold. Ola felt herself violently wretch, the bitter taste of bile and prosecco at the back of her throat. She fell to her knees. For a moment, she couldn't hear or feel anything. It was some time before Ola realised... She was having a panic attack. Foller and Ruth near carried her through the marquee. What kind of red wedding shit is this? She heard Ruth say. I don't know, said Foller, opening the door and getting in next to Ola in the back seat of the Uber. Ola rolled the window down as far as she could, gulping the air that rushed in. When they got into Ola's flat, her sister ushered her to bed, where she collapsed into a heap that she didn't leave for days. Foller postponed her flight, lying alongside Ola as she cried herself to sleep. The backlash was even more extreme than she expected, due to all tea posting about the hashtag the quarantines 19 on their Instagram page. Looks like we've lost our very own Black Beckhams. Comment below. And comment they did in their droves. Ola's hypocrisy, her self-proclaimed feminist status, made them seem angry at her than at Michael at times. She told Foller to pass on the message that Michael should not contact her. The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. Read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 8. In this episode, Ola returns to work for the first time since the wedding. But what will her boss Frankie say? And will she still have a job? And Michael realises that staying offline is like being on the run. Today... Ola was going to have to venture beyond her front door for the first time since the wedding. Her boss, Frankie, had asked to see her face to face that afternoon. Her colleagues stared when she entered the Wimink's offices. Kieran watched her pass and mouthed something frantically at her. Oh, Ola, darling, Frankie said on her entry. Please do sit down. Can I get you a glass of water? Ola shook her head. No, thanks. I just want to get this over with, if that's okay. Of course. Ola, she said gently. It wasn't the tone she had been expecting. Am I that ghastly a boss? Ola shook her head. Not at all, she said in a tiny voice. So why didn't you tell me? I panicked, Frankie, she said. I saw Michael's name on the list, had a meltdown in the toilets, tried to hold it together. But then five minutes later, you asked me to write about it. You do realise, had you told me, I would have immediately pulled you off it, Frankie said. To be honest, I was trying to hold off on us writing anything at all. You wanted a something in depth, names, identities. Yes, said Frankie. But if I'd known what was happening in the first place... At that moment, Ola felt very stupid indeed. Please know that Kieran was completely against holding off, she said. 
I put her in a very difficult position, so I hope she won't be fired too. Frankie looked stunned. When did I mention anything about firing anyone? She said. Oh, said a flabbergasted Olla. She had gone into work today, prepared to pick up her P-45. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Frankie. You're welcome, her boss said with a self-satisfied smile. Frankly, sacking you would be shooting myself in the foot. I can't think of anywhere better for you to tell your story than at Womix. Olla froze. My story? Yes, Frankie chirped. What it's like to wake up to see your other half on the list. As a feminist, too, a feminist journalist, no less, with one month to go till your wedding. How did you decide you were going to stay with him? I'm assuming he's innocent. Unless, Frankie let out a little gasp, you weren't forced, were you? No, Olla shrieked. The shift in their conversation had happened at breakneck speed. But, Frankie, I... I don't think I can. Frankie leaned back in her chair. Well, Ola, she said coolly, you do owe me an article, and a first-hand piece would be incredibly powerful, she leaned forward. This is a chance to rebuild your reputation. You must have seen what people are saying, Ola. This was the Frankie Ola knew and loathed. When it came to Womix, she was ruthless. Olla stared at her smiling boss, dumbstruck. Don't you care, she managed at last, about anything other than clicks and traffic and views. Frankie forced a hollow laugh. <laughs> I'm running a business, Ola, and I've never once pretended to be doing anything else. So the answer to your question is no. No, I don't. She tapped her desk with her knuckles. Now, I'm not expecting it immediately, of course. I'll give you some time to think about your approach. Getting to her feet, Olla looked the office over once more. Frankie, she said. I quit. She then walked straight towards the door of the woman's office without looking back. Michael's living room was shrouded in darkness. He'd been splayed across his couch in a faded pair of boxes for the best part of the week. As his phone vibrated for the umpteenth time, Michael ignored it. That morning, Lewis Hale had posted a statement online regarding the list and several hours later, the subsequent fallout was all anyone could talk about. Lewis Hale had given Michael one final chance to join him in making the statement before he posted it. Michael told him again he didn't think it was a good idea. All right, son. Fair enough. Lewis had written back. Other way will be all right. Earlier that day, it looked like the plan had been thwarted. Lewis was due to release his statement at 7.30am, but another had pipped him to the post. A blog was published on Medium by a woman named Noor El Masri, a student at SOAS. It was titled What I Wish I Said Then and gave an account of her abuse at the hands of sports journalist Matthew Plummer when she was only 15 years old. By the final line, Noor and all the women she and Ola talked of were real to Michael. Noor had a face, a baby face too. The accompanying picture of her and Matthew at the event made the post even more harrowing. He could have been her father were it not for the queasy hand placement. Surely, Michael had thought, even Lewis would see that the timing was all wrong. It was an abject failure to read the room. But Lewis, a national treasure, had posted his statement that morning. Two short paragraphs screenshotted from the notes app denying the accusations of violence and homophobia and asking to stop the fake news. The timing was horrendous. Michael expanded the comment section underneath. 
This guy really just hashtag all lives mattered his apology. Shocked, surprised, angry emojis. On the same day as Noor El Mazar's statement. This should have stayed in the drafts, chief. To make matters worse, football fans in their droves rushed to his defence, decrying the snowflakes, melts and faggots who had commented. His team must have been playing whack-a-mole with his mentions. By the time Michael called Lewis that afternoon, he'd already been spat at on his way to Waitrose. By early evening, any pretense Lewis was fine had swiftly faded when he rang Michael to tell him he had been doxxed. His mobile number had leaked and death threats were being sent directly to his family. I haven't been this shaken up in a while, I'll be honest, he'd said to Michael on the phone, the fear rattling in his voice. I've got thick skin, but the girls, the things they're sending them. And Sam blames me, of course. Michael, I just need this to stop. I'm really sorry, bro, Michael said. Lewis had been trying not to bawl down the phone. On the advice of his agent, he was staying offline until it calmed down. Michael knew that disappearing offline was like being on the run. You could never relax. You only waited for them to catch up. Ola heard the doorbell go, followed by a series of loud knocks. It was Seely. She'd agreed to see her yesterday, after days spent gradually easing back into the group chat. When she opened the door, Seely was stood exactly as Ola knew she would be, arms crossed, carrier bags at her ankles. She was in a red polka dot wrap, a denim jacket, and her black ballet flats. Her hair was scraped back into two enormous bunches. Ola smiled. Seely looked like a pint-sized, pissed-off Minnie Mouse. Seely made her way to the kitchen and began to unpack two Tesco bags. In them were all of Ola's favourite snacks. Ola felt a lump forming in her throat and coughed. Thanks, Seely. They sat down to watch Friends stiffly. Ola sat cross-legged on her bed, Seely perched as primly as she could on the green beanbag in front of her. Have you spoken to Michael? No, not yet. I need to stop acting like I didn't make a choice, though, Ola went on. I didn't have to say I do. You really didn't, Seely muttered. Ola shifted on the bed uncomfortably. Seely, please... I appreciate you coming, but I can't get into this right now. The Ola I thought I knew wouldn't just shrug at allegations as serious as the ones against Michael, Celie said, her voice unusually shaky. Ola knew Celie's stance on things, but was astonished to hear her spell it out so bluntly. Like you know anything, said Ola, exasperated. None of us can say what is or isn't true on the list. Well, I can, her friend said. The crack in her voice was faint, but Ola caught it and froze. What's that supposed to mean? Seely said nothing. She looked away from Ola, her eyes fixed on the screen. Seely seriously. Ola uncrossed her legs. She lightly nudged the dip in Seely's back. What's going on? Seely didn't respond. Okay, you're scaring me. What happened? Ola said. I was assaulted, Seely said quietly. You were? Seely. What? She could hear Seely's rapid breathing before she spoke again. It happened two years ago. Seely was holding onto the sides of the beanbag. Oh my God, Seely, I... I'm so sorry. Ola sprang from the bed and rushed forward towards her friend. I'm an idiot. No... I didn't tell you. That's on me, Seely said, her voice controlled. But that's why I... The list. I've been trying to... You don't have to explain, Ola interjected. I can't even imagine how triggering this must be. You don't get it, Ola. Seely stared forward. Haven't you ever wondered why I'm so sure the men on the list are animals? 
why I couldn't give Michael the benefit of the doubt. Olla's head was swimming with what felt like hot lava. Seely, no. Michael didn't. No, no. Michael did not do anything to me, Seely said. Olla's body immediately flooded with short-lived relief. Duro did. Or Pappy Danks to you lot. You know we've known each other since we were kids. Went to Sunday school. Olla hardly dared to breathe. It happened the night we went to that label party. In that bar on Old Street, said Seely. Some guys from the label offered to give us a lift to the after party. Olla didn't remember the lift. She drank far too much that night. She knew that Seely would only have accompanied her to make sure she was safe. She did remember that when they arrived, the walls had been vibrating with the sounds of Pappy Dank's sweet like Puff Puff. You saw some people you knew, and we made small talk while you were gone, Seely said. He asked how my brother was doing, said he wanted to give him a mixtape, so he told me to come outside to his car. When I got in, his whole demeanour changed. He started touching me. I tried to get out, but he was restraining my arms. And he said he'd hurt me if I didn't give him oral sex. It took some time to get the words out, but when she did, she was devoid of emotion, flat and clinical. The women sat without speaking for a moment, the laughter from friends jarring their silence. Everything Olla thought she knew about her friend was shattered. Celie never spoke about sex, and she and Ruth had simply assumed that she was waiting until she got married. I didn't even think it counted as real rape. It was only after I went to the police that they told me that the definition included, you know... Forced, she took a sharp intake of breath. Forced penetration of the mouth. You, you went to the police, Olla managed. Celie nodded. It took me a year and a half, but I knew nothing would come of it. It failed the evidential test. She closed her eyes tightly. I was relieved. I didn't want to go through it all again with someone like Pappy Danks. What if the trial went public? I left you with him, Olla said weakly. No, Celie's tone was almost scolding. Olla, it wasn't your fault. But I did, Celie. And you've been listening to me cry about Michael. She was desperately trying to not let everything she was feeling spill over. What made it even harder not to break down was knowing that if she did, her friend would not hesitate to comfort her. The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. Read by Tracy Ifacho and Clifford Samuel. Episode 9. In this episode, after the wedding, Michael meets up with the other man on the list. It doesn't end well, and Michael has to make a decision to say something that could have devastating consequences. The day after the wedding, Lewis had added Michael to an online group chat in support of the men on the list. Ben Abassi, a prominent YouTuber, was the group's self-appointed spokesperson. After the fallout from Lewis's statement, he decided to take action and invited some of them to his penthouse. We gotta organise, he announced. How else are we supposed to defeat these feminazis? Lewis was still off-grid, but Amani had demanded to come with Michael. I don't know why you think these men are your enemies, bro. Michael had anticipated a sit-down meeting but instead, it was a drink-up and the mood felt jarringly jovial. Amani tapped Michael's shoulder 
and motioned towards the sofa. Pappy Danks is here, he said, unable to hide his excitement. Mad thing. Michael looked over. He knew it was Danks immediately, from his look. High fade, freshly trimmed, in the tracksuit with extravagant jewellery. Michael felt all wrong about him. He'd been accused of terrifying things on the list, rape, kidnap, sexual battery. But he had as much proof of Danks's guilt as he did of his own. It's all part of the emasculation of black men, you feel me? A man in a beanie hat was saying. You're speaking facts, Amani shouted. Michael winced. All they needed were mics and it could have been an episode of court slipping. Amani's eyes were now fixed on Danks, who was headed through the sliding patio doors. I'm going to holler him, Amani said, power walking in the same direction. See if I can get him down the gym for some promo. Michael's phone was pulsing in his pocket. It was Ola. He stepped into the night air. Sorry for calling so late. Ola's voice was hoarse, as if she'd been crying. She paused. Are you out? she said. The music blaring from the living room was still audible outside. I am. I'm with Omani. I'll explain later when I bell you. Why can't you explain now? Ola said, her voice tinged with aggravation. Michael knew what he said next would likely lead to several more days of silence from her. I got talking to Lewis Hale a while back, and he introduced me to some other guys on the list. A few of us got together. The annoyance he'd heard earlier in Ola's voice now sounded like alarm. Is Pappy Danks there? Yeah, he is, he said, puzzled. Why? Michael, you need to leave. Now. She sounded jumpy, panicked. He was startled but tried to calm her down. Listen, I know what the list says about him. I'm not chilling with him. Trust me. It isn't some rumour, Michael. He hurt someone I know. His heart skipped a beat. Why did Ola sound so afraid? His face felt as hot as a furnace suddenly. His hand balled into a fist. D did he do something to you? He said. Me? Michael, no! Ola near shouted. Ola, if he touched you, I swear. He didn't! Ola took another moment before she spoke again. It was Seely, okay? I can't go into it, but the allegations about him are true. Michael stood there, phone still to his ear after she dropped the call. Eventually, he pulled it away and walked towards Danks and Amani laughing on the terrace. He gave Danks a tap on the shoulder that was closer to a shove. You know my girl's friend? Michael said. Ah, oh, yeah, Danks said, licking the edge of the Rizzler. What's her name? Celestina. Dank's jaw tightened. Michael clocked his eyes, scanning the patio. Rah, Celestina, he said. Yeah, I know her still. We go way back, he sniggered. She stopped with her lying, yeah? Lying? Amani said. Yeah, yeah, we used to go same Sunday school as you, it's in it. Celestina's known for chatting shit, twisting things. Michael could see a vein throbbing in Danks's neck. Boy, I never had her down as the type, Amani said. I thought she was mad Christian. <laughs> They're the worst ones, bruv, Pappy Danks said with a hearty laugh. Last time I saw her at some industry thing a few years ago, she was acting like one reckless pastor's daughter. She was on man, he said, smiling, his gold tooth glinting. Michael's ears began to hum. Rotted. Silly, Amani said. Michael had reached boiling point, irrepressible rage rolling through his body. You're a rapist, he spat. In a blink, Danks leapt towards him. Before he could think, Michael was lashing out at Danks, fists trying to connect with whatever part of his body they could. Hey, Michael, chill, allow it, man. Amani turned to Danks, palm outstretched dodging his swinging arms. He's waved. He don't mean it. He pushed Michael towards the door. Oi, come.
Come on, man, let's go. By now, Ben was outside too, and a few of the other men were trying to hold off Danks's boys. Michael was dragged away by a panting Amani down the stairwell. Bro, what are you trying to do? Amani said. Half his bars were about stabbing guys up. Hey, shut up, man, Michael barked. That dickhead Danks is a lowlife. What do you mean? Michael stared at Amani in utter disbelief. He's been accused of rape. Accused? Amani's face contorted with confusion. What, like you? And half the man here? Michael blinked hard. Amani, you've been my boy since I was 11. How can you even compare it? I ain't comparing nothing. But how can you violate, man, because of the same shit that's happening to you? Whatever, man. Michael began to walk away from his oldest friend. Waste man! Amani shouted after him. Michael knew what he had to do. There was nowhere left to go. He opened WhatsApp and sent Ola the message he'd hoped he'd never have to. I need to speak to you in person. It's about why I'm on the list. Ola walked wordlessly into the living room, Michael trailing behind her. She made sure not to sit down. She just wanted to hear him say it. No equivocations, no pleas, the truth. Then he could get out of her flat and her life forever. Michael wiped his brow with the back of his hand. You remember we had problems when I wasn't working? She almost laughed. He wasn't even five minutes in before he was placing the blame at her doorstep. And during that period, Michael lowered his gaze. Me and Jackie started talking again. Ola felt her knees buckle. It hadn't occurred to her that Michael would be confessing to anything else other than the allegations being true. We didn't sleep together, he said. He wiped his running nose with his T-shirt like a primary school kid. Never met up, nothing like that. But it was a complete disrespect. Before I proposed, I locked it off for good. But Jackie was upset about it. And I think... He started again with more conviction. Ola... I know she put me on the list. I never threatened her, never hit her, nothing. But she warned me she was going to do something. Of course. The whole time, Luke had been looking for the wrong thing. Michael was lying about something, but she hadn't even suspected infidelity. She's been trolling me on that Mirrorissa 92 account, he went on. Because I can, Mikey. Ola's mind went back to the screenshot she'd seen on Michael's laptop. Ola, Michael said, his hands touched together in beseechment. I know there's nothing I can say to make this right. After everything. You went back to Jackie, Ola went on, of all the people. The one person you promised me you would never speak to again. Michael clasped his hands behind his back as if ready to be physically flogged. I'm so sorry, Ola. Ola tried to breathe deeply for a moment to quieten her rage. What did you do? She asked. Mainly texts, FaceTimes, nudes, nothing physical. And sexting? Ola said, feeling the bile rise within her throat. Michael pushed the heels of his hands into his eyes and groaned. Oh, sometimes it went there, yeah, he said eventually. But we never acted on anything in real life. I didn't want to disrespect. Ola shoved him. With such force, he nearly fell. Don't you dare, Michael, she thundered. Respect? Really? Michael held her gaze. I just want to be honest. And then what? Hmm? Ola said. You expect me to believe anything you say ever again. But I need you to know that me and Jackie, we didn't... Michael bleated. Anger was now howling in her ears. You have never been good enough for me. And you never will be. Just leave. 
Ola slammed the door behind him with all the strength left in her body. By the time Michael stood at the Elephant and Castle roundabout later that day, it was rush hour. He took sullen swigs from his bottle, gripping a post to steady himself. What was below rock bottom? Hell? Hell bottom. That's where he was likely headed. Soon after Michael had left Ollas that morning, he received his first message about the piece in Wimex magazine. Lewis, who he hadn't heard from in days, sent the link. The men amongst us, UK media's hashtag MeToo moment, was the headline. It mentioned the wedding hashtag takeover, referring to the groom as a former podcaster who had been hired by Q-rated after race row. That description made him entirely identifiable. By the time he reached his front door, it was dripping with egg yolk. Within the hour, Beth had emailed for an emergency meeting in Q-rated's Camden office. Michael, his boss said, please sit down. It was disarming how terse Sebastian sounded when his sentences were stripped of their mates. We've been trying to find a way forward with your situation. Unfortunately, after the publication of an article outlining serious allegations concerning your conduct, a number of colleagues have reiterated their discomfort. We feel your position has become untenable. Regretfully, we'll be terminating your contract, effective immediately. But the restraining order doesn't exist, Michael pleaded. You know this. We're sorry, Mike, Beth said under her breath. So let me get this straight, Michael said. You lot are firing me to protect your reputation. As if that's not why I was hired in the first place. Sebastian surreptitiously eyed his watch and then Beth. I'll let you take it from here, yeah? He said, not even looking in Michael's direction. I tried my best, Beth said, as the door shut behind them. After the not-rated fiasco, we just can't afford to be thought of as sexists as well as racists. Michael could think of nothing else to do other than shake his head. The white sands of Q-rated's white guilt had finally reached the other end of the hourglass. He stopped at a newsagent to buy a bottle of Jack Daniels before making his way to Elephant and Castle. His vision was becoming unfocused as he surveyed the roundabout. I could end this, Michael thought, right now. He could shut his eyes and step into the oncoming traffic. Ola never wanted to see him again, so what did he have to lose? Draining the bottle, he began to cross the road haphazardly as cars and delivery bikes sped past. Michael didn't flinch as they beeped their horns. A few more slow, sluggish steps towards the soft red blob of the traffic light. What came next happened fast. He heard the car horn and screams before he saw the headlights. He saw the buildings across the street turn to sky. And then he saw nothing. The next moment he woke up in a hospital bed with a brace on his neck, a drip in his arm and a tube down his throat. When his eyes flickered open, the first face he saw was Ola's, leaning over his broken body like he was a baby in a cot. Don't try to talk, Ola said, brushing his hand lightly with hers. Her eyebrows were knitted at the middle, like a doctor at his bedside about to give terrible news. Something has happened. The List, written by Yomi Adegoke and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. Read by Tracy Ifacho, Clifford Samuel and Tyler Cameron. Episode 10. 
In this episode, which begins at Guy's Hospital in London, there is heartbreaking news. We move on to a year after the wedding. Can the list finally be put to rest for Ola? Orpington police confirmed that shortly before 5.30pm on the 14th of June 2019, Lewis Hale was found unresponsive in his bedroom. The coroner gave a provisional medical cause of death as suspension by ligature. The next morning, the papers ran stories about his marital issues, financial problems and his suicide note, in which he wrote at length about it all, including his struggles with his sexuality. The outpouring was immediate and overwhelming. You were such a class act, a total gent and an absolute legend, one sports presenter had written. A mural of him in his Crystal Palace kit was spray-painted on the side of the Elephant and Castle shopping centres. A silent vigil was held at Selhurst Park. Mourners watched the funeral procession, holding candles and balloons. It spawned a campaign called Hashtag Think First, which was soon emblazoned across T-shirts and Twitter headers. Then MPs jumped on the issue. A petition to pass Lewis's law Combating online defamation reached over 100,000 signatures. When Ola had first told Michael, it didn't quite sink in. The shock of the accident and the fentanyl had made him tired and off kilter. He saw it on the news the next morning. The room began to swim. He'd been grateful his mother was asleep, that she hadn't had to comfort him during that moment of realisation, his heart sinking to the pit of his stomach, the quiet tears. For three weeks, Michael stayed in Guy's hospital, his mother and Ola at his bedside every day without fail. They took turns reading to him, talking at him, while he stared distractedly out of the window. On the day he was discharged, Ola and his mother picked him up to take him to his parents' house. As Ola approached the boot with his bag, she gave his hand a small squeeze, one that told him that none of it, the wedding, the lies, the hurt, mattered in this moment. Using all the little strength he had regained, Michael squeezed hers back. A year later, they walked slowly, side by side, through the light autumn breeze. Looks good on you, Michael said, nodding towards her honey blonde braids. Ola loved the way the gold popped against her skin. She'd spent the morning meticulously making sure this was the case. Well, (laughs) blondes have more fun, right? And after the last year, she trailed off. Michael nodded. Just don't come at my shit with a baseball bat, yeah? They laughed as if no time had passed at all. The tension between them hadn't taken long to dissipate. It was just over a year since Guy's hospital had called Ola in as Michael's emergency contact. The swiftness with which she had gone from raging to racked with fear had given her emotional whiplash. It wasn't as though it had made her realise she loved him. She already knew that. Rather, seeing him lying there made her realise she didn't want him dead. The week she spent by his bedside and breaking down out of sight in the corridor made her certain that she would love Michael for the rest of her life, but also certain that That wasn't a good enough reason to spend it with him. There was no coming back from Jackie, at least not as the newlywed Mr and Mrs Corin Ting, the poster children of black love that had become an unwitting cautionary tale. Michael, you'll have eight days to respond, the lawyer had explained that afternoon, and the next step will be an application for a decree nicey The wedding had cost over £30,000, and yet, to undo it all, 
five hundred and fifty. Still can't believe we never had married sex, Michael joked when they left. It was a shared coping mechanism, the banter. Olla was surprised that she was rather enjoying their stroll through the chill of Battersea Park. She was ready to talk. How are you? You still training? She wasn't sure because Michael was no longer on social media. Right now, he looked every bit the college tutor, with his smart casual jacket and chinos, his hair grown out into thick textured curls. I switched to part-time, so I've got a year and a bit left now, he answered. Marcia said I've got to take my time with everything. Ole gave an approving nod. The hospital had referred him to Marcia, the therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder after the accident. It had been Marcia who'd encouraged him to do his PGCE. And you? he asked. What's freelancing saying? <laughs> it's good. An agent liked my book proposal on the rise of female rappers. Think I'm going to sign with her. Ola's only regret was not leaving Wimink sooner. She earned more now and wrote about whatever she wanted. Plus, she was never late, since her desk was in her bedroom. Michael drove his hands into his pockets. So, are you dating? I'm just focusing on myself right now, really, working on the book, Ola said. She tried to make her voice sound as nonchalant as possible. Are you? He shook his head, and Ola realised she'd been holding her breath. Nah, the list still comes up if you go down far enough on the Google results. Not the greatest dating app, icebreaker. Besides, he added, eyeing Ola, if I couldn't make it work with you, probably can't make it work with anyone. They walked further, laughing and catching up. Then, as they made their way past the children's zoo, Ola saw her. She recognised her instantly, even though her hair was different. A blunt, cut black bob. She was holding the hand of a girl who hopped along the pathway. Her other hand was pushing a stroller. As Ola got closer, the orb of her stomach became more pronounced. Ola had never thought she was pretty, but today, Jackie Assair was radiant, with that undeniable pregnancy glow. Watching her, Ola suddenly felt intensely that something had been stolen from her. Ola was running now. Oi! she shouted in Jackie's direction. She swore Jackie caught her eye. As Ola gained pace, she careened into an adolescent on an electric scooter, knocking him clean off and halting her stride. When she looked back over to Jackie, she was gone. Ola stood stupefied for a moment, searching vainly from left to right. Before long, Michael was beside her. He pulled her towards a bench, and she gripped his arm as she sat trying to breathe. <sighs> Did you see her? Michael nodded. I mean, it looked like her. Might not have been, though. It was her, Ola said. He pressed his shoulder into hers lightly. Are you all right? No. That woman messed up our marriage before it even started, Michael, Ola said, her voice breaking. I still have nightmares about our wedding day. And then she went on with her life. No consequences, no charges, not even an apology, Ola was bellowing now. She can't get away with it. She waited for Michael's concurrence, but he continued to sit quietly. I don't know, man. I guess I've got used to the idea that she will, he said. Marcia warned me I might not ever get closure. If you went up to Jackie today, she probably wouldn't admit it. Plus, plus what? Plus, she's already taken so much, Ola, he sighed. She took my job, my health, the only woman I've ever loved, the only woman I ever will love. Ola felt her heart skip. Don't get me wrong. I know I did dirt. 
but I can't let her take the small piece I finally got. You can't either. You get me? Ola fell back onto the bench, dog-tired, and sighed. Kind of. They sat there for some time, listening to the leaves rustling in the breeze. <laughs> that was kind of sexy, though. You run in to go and knock her out, Michael said eventually. Ola chewed at the inside of her cheek to suppress a laugh. Marcia still has work to do, I see. Michael laughed too. <laughs> We still good to get a coffee. Ola dusted the front of her dress. I have time for one turmeric latte, she said, unable to conceal her smile at Michael's own. That stretched from ear to ear. Aaron. When Jackie got inside, she locked and bolted the door behind her. She tried her best to stay composed, but her hands were shaking. Aaron came out into the hallway. One look at Jackie's face, and he knew something wasn't right. Babe? He asked, concern in his voice. What's wrong? I just saw Michael and Allah, she said quietly, in Battersea Park. Aaron hated hearing Jackie say his name. Hated thinking about her anywhere near that man. His jaw and his fish clenched in unison but he tried to maintain his characteristically chipper exterior. Oh, rah, he said. They're still together. Jackie shrugged. I don't know. But Ola clocked me, and the next thing I know, she's running at me from across the park, like some mad woman, shouting. Michael was behind her, coming at me too. I'm still shaken up. Heat flashed through Aaron. Did he touch her? He rasped. No. Jackie said. I managed to get out of there before anything could pop off. It was just a shock. She shuddered. After all this time, after everything that came out about Michael last year, all that shit with their wedding, it's me she's coming for. I've moved on. I thought they would have by now. She squeezed Aaron's shoulder as if for emphasis. I've made no contact since it ended with either of them. Aaron took her in his arms and stroked her hair. I'm so sorry this is still affecting us, she sobbed. Aaron sighed and shushed her. We all make mistakes. You're not that person anymore. She sniffed. I love you so much, baby, she said. He cupped her chin before kissing her lightly. I love you too. He then placed his palms on the curve of her belly. And you too, little man. Jackie fell asleep on the couch soon after. As she dozed, Aaron crept back into the kitchen to put the kettle on. It had been impulsive, putting Michael's name on the list. The list that had been sent to him by his sister, who worked as an A&R. Pappy Danks was her former client. In Aaron's hands, it was anonymous, an immediate way of settling the score. As he typed Michael's name into the spreadsheet, Aaron accepted that he might never get over Jackie's affair. He thought about the sleepless nights, the humiliation. Using Jackie's phone, he wrote everything he wanted to say to Michael in messages from her number. Promised to ruin his life. Okay, so he'd employed a little poetic license. Who could say if it was abuse? It was likely, wasn't it? The way he treated Jackie. Aaron was keeping her safe. Aaron joined RT as Mirarisa 92. Less to progress an agenda and more to vent. In truth, he'd got a thrill out of letting Michael know exactly why he'd done it. Because I can. Mikey. But the allegations took on a life of their own. In all those chat rooms and forums, the endless harassment, the doxing, the wedding hashtag takeover, even he knew that was a step too far. Ola was collateral damage. There was nothing that could be done to pull it back or slow it all down. Some days, 
he would scroll the RT forum in muted shock. When he'd heard that Michael had ended up in hospital after a collision with a car, he kept him awake at night. But Aaron had promised Michael that he'd ruin his life. And he'd made good on his promises. As the kettle came to a boil, he heard Jackie stirring awake on the couch. Babe, she called sleepily. Aaron stared into space as he poured the water into Jackie's favourite mug. He felt tension release from his neck. Come in, baby, he shouted as he made his way back into the living room. The list was written by Yomi Adagoki and abridged by Julian Wilkinson. The readers were Tracy Ifacho, Clifford Samuel and Tyler Cameron. The producer was Tracy Neal. The list was a BBC Books production for BBC Sounds. 